Okay. So I did mine on pre-hospital ultrasound. Um, people also will refer to it as just like EMS ultrasound. Um, but yeah. Uh, hello. Okay. So why use uh, pre-hospital ultrasound? Uh, well, as we all know, uh, in these conditions, uh, the patient is undergoing, you know, a acute medical emergency, right? So in most cases, obviously, we can just focus on transporting the patient to the hospital. But in, you know, in some cases, we need to know what's going on. Um, and ultrasound provides a fantastic way of doing that because it is portable, non-invasive, and we get fast and instant results as we uh, look through um, the patient. So in what ways can we use ultrasound um, in EMS or in the pre-hospital setting? Um, there are a million different uh, scenarios, I guess, where you could use it, but the main ones are trauma, um, cardiovascular emergencies, respiratory distress, and then there are a few others that I, I found interesting, so we'll talk about those as well. But starting off with trauma, um, I think we're all familiar with uh, the majority of these uh, uh, protocols for uh, assessing uh, patients. Um, so you get FAST, EFAST, um, and this other one called PREP. Um, but essentially, it's just a systematic way of looking through um, the patient and assessing for any serious injuries or um, life-threatening you know, conditions that are going on. But a key point I want to talk about is that it's not really, at least in the setting of of um, a pre-hospital setting, it's not really a diagnostic tool. It's more to just give us an idea um, and help predict what type of um, intervention the patient will need. Um, and that's really the, the most important part of ultrasound in this setting. Um, so this is a, uh, a review done a few years ago, um, looking at how different, uh, different forms of ultrasound um, or yeah, different types of ultrasound, different protocols um, under different, different settings. So we can actually see that like, you know, the G, the I, you know, under these, so like G is ground. Uh, and then I think I is in flight. So like a, like a helicopter of some sort. Um, so you can see that actually they're, the sensitivity and the specificity. So the accuracy of being able to detect um, so most things are pretty good. Um, and this study supports the idea that, you know, uh, practitioners could in theory, um, successfully use uh, ultrasound um, in those settings. Um, and this also looks at the impact that it had, right? So how did it impact treatment? Um, the percentages here you have, also how it, how it you know, affected their choice of transport and destination, um, and if they use that information and relate it to the hospital or not. Um, so I thought that was a, a very interesting. And we'll come back to this graph because it also um, we'll explain another point further down. Um, another use of ultrasound for um, in EMS settings is cardiovascular emergencies. Uh, so here's some stats that I want to start with first. Um, this first one, roughly 300,000 people a year in the United States have a uh, cardiac, go into cardiac arrest, and only 9.6 um, are discharged from the hospital, um, which is... A staggering number. Um, the second one is the rate of survival decreases every minute, um, and that adds up very quickly. Uh, so, see, so like assessing a patient and figuring out, you know, what type of intervention they need is very, very important. Um, and then this is this shocked me actually because obviously we have to figure out, you know, does the patient have a pulse? Yes or no. That if not, then we have certain things to do. If if they, if they do, but their pulse is weak, then we also have other interventions. Um, and a a manual detection of um, pulses don't seem to be that reliable. So yeah, they're not they're they're not very reliable. So ultrasound actually seems to have a much much higher success rate in detecting um, uh, pulses versus. Uh, just your standard, you know, carotid check and that sort of thing. Um, however, time constraint is always an issue, right? Um, so for a trained uh, practitioner, it's pretty, you know, they can do it in a pretty comparable speed. Um, the question is, can other, can paramedics learn to do the same thing? Um, and that's always a, a concern. Um, but obviously, we can always rely on using ultrasound to identify if a patient has a pulse or not. 
Um, so yeah, this is another one that uh, another study that suggests that ultrasound is way better in detecting um, pulses, uh, especially certain pulses that are just physically not detectable with without um, ultrasound or just by um, you know manual pulse check. So there are many cases where ultrasound should have been or could have been used to detect um, an electrical pulse, um, and unfortunately that didn't happen. So respiratory distress, that is another um, common uh, issue that EMTs faces, face all the time. Uh, and ultrasound, as we know, is pretty good at, at detecting uh, some abnormalities. Um, obviously for interventions, it's useful for guiding needles, um, but there are also other conditions that can be assessed, um, such as pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, or effusions. So like, for example, if a patient is struggling to breathe, right, what could it be? Are they you know, having some um, aller allergic reaction or could it be one of these conditions, right? And a, uh, an ultrasound could help evaluate that on the spot. Um, as we know, there's a different types of abnormalities we can see in an ultrasound. Um, there are some other applications that I found really interesting. Um, one obviously is assessing volume status. So, you know, depending on how you, you know, you see a patient who perhaps they need some resuscitation. You have no idea, you know, is it the heart stopped? Like what's going on? Um, this can help us see if they have internal bleeding um, so we can give them fluids. Um, but if, you know, if you give fluids to a patient who doesn't need fluids, that could actually cause more damage. So it's a very good way to see if the patient, to see what the patient needs in, in those scenarios. Another one that I found really interesting is intracranial pressure. I had no idea that ultrasound could actually analyze the brain in any way. But apparently that's a thing. Um, so here's a ultrasound of a hematoma in the brain. I thought that was really cool. Um, and this is a this is an old uh, an older study, but it was a, neuro, a neurologist, I, I believe, in a helicopter assessing a stroke patient, um, and they were able to using a do the Doppler effect actually visualize and um, determine that the patient did indeed have uh, a stroke. Um, so that was really cool to to see that that's a pot that's a possibility, um, but you know, like everything, there are cons, there are shortcomings, um, and ultrasound is no different. The main issue, at least here in the United States, is that um, emergency services usually employ um, paramedics, and they don't have the same proficiency as um, so, you know you know certified sonographers or you know, physicians. So training is always um, a big if you know. Uh, big question mark. So the the common pitfalls are obviously image acqu acquisition. As we've all experienced, it's difficult to find sometimes the right angle, um, and this and this is just is we need a lot of practice for it. That's just how it works. Um, on top of that, interpretation, being able to understand what we're actually looking at, um, time constraint uh, in an EMS setting. Um, obviously, time is very crucial. It's an emergency, so the longer it takes for a uh, paramedic to actually assess a patient, you know, the the higher chance of some irreversible damage happening. Um, and obviously cost, cost of training. Um, you have, you know, it's a massive workforce that will have to be um, trained to use ultrasound. But there are some very interesting data that supports the um, the training of, of, uh, of paramedics. So in this study, 104 paramedics, um, they were trained to evaluate um, both using FAST and AA scans, abdominal aorta scans. Um, and they got a, you know, 100% score with, with their assessments um, with a mean timing of 2.6 minutes, which is pretty quick, faster than, than I think we could do in, um, in our short time practicing. Um, and a caveat with this, I think, well, not a caveat, but a very cool point is that they only spent, I think, an hour um, they had one hour session, um, very intensive hour session, but that was all they took to to get to this point where they could actually um, have high high rates of, of success. This other um, this other thing, yeah, this other study looked at uh, paramedics and physicians. Um, I think it was two physicians, two attendings, and two residents, um, comparing them to paramedics, um, and the accuracy was pretty comparable. Um, and finally, this is another one. This study was actually in Colorado. Um, and they did a four-hour course um, specifically on cardiac evaluation. And they had pretty respectable results um, in just four hours. 
Um, and this kind of addresses the, the idea that, you know, cost um, would be an issue because, you know, a clearly very short periods of time um, can yield high results in terms of training. Um, so um, there are other things, other factors that we need to consider when um, trying to implement um, ultrasound. Uh, so external conditions, conditions kind of outside of, of our control. Um, so it's patient location, their condition, um, whether they can cooperate or not, um, and also the mode of transportation, all of these need to be considered. Um, and this is what I wanted to come back to that earlier study, looking at um, the different types of transport. Um, you can see that some of the types of evaluations don't have a very high success. Some because the patients just didn't have any of that um, present, but others, it was just very difficult. Um, obviously, with, take, take all this with a grain of salt. This is done with physicians and mixed practitioners, so it's not a perfect representation of, um, of just paramedics, at least here in the United States. Although in Europe, um, there are physicians that are part of the um, you know, EMS team. But here we can see that at least um, in some circumstances, the accuracy isn't as high as we'd like it to be. Um, so those are things that obviously can um, will need to be worked on if this needs, if this is going to be implemented here in the states. And again, um, we can also see that in some cases it didn't you know it didn't doesn't seem to be that big of an effect in terms of uh, guiding um, the decisions in terms of where uh, the patients are going to be taken. Um, but perhaps that in some of these you know those 12 patients that were taken to the specific hospital, they needed to be taken to that specific hospital, right? Um, so it's, obviously there are um, some questions as to how effective this will be um, in terms of, of deciding, you know, and, and impacting decision decisions. But I think there's still a lot that, um, that can and should be considered. So what is the future of uh, pre-hospital ultrasound? Well, we've talked a lot about AI uh, recently, but before I get to that, I want to talk about something else that I think, um, uh, well, I think some one of us was just talking about how uh, we had a previous presentation on like video transmission. Um, so I want to add on to that as well. Um, obviously, I was reading a study earlier that I think it was made in 2008, and they were trying to do... Um, telehealth essentially with ultrasound and the biggest point of failure in that scenario uh, in that study was the fact that um, the connections were so unreliable um, the battery life was short um, the connections just couldn't transmit information um, effectively but today we have obviously a next generation of um, cellular communications 5g and even lte um, and um, this study actually proposed um, this is a, a study in japan proposed actually that um, in their mountainous regions, this could be a, a very viable solution, not just for telehealth in terms of like relaying from, you know, uh, images back to someone who can interpret them, but also at, on the scene, you could um, evaluate a patient and then send information back to the hospital. Um, and that would actually expedite, you know, potentially whether they need imaging or send them straight into a procedure like surgery. Um, and so these are very valuable um, tools and things that can um, definitely expedite a patient's care. Um, so AI, that's a big buzzword these days, uh, especially in the last few years. Um, there are a lot of really cool applications. Um, I think uh, we have I've already touched on, on most of them, um, but here is a kind of a flow chart uh, of a different ways that AI can be implemented. So if you just look across the green, um, the green uh, row here, that would be kind of the standard practice of ultrasound, right? So a doctor or sonographer will just scan and look at the image and then measure um, and then diagnose. But under each of those steps, um, software can actually augment that um, and potentially make that better. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys a few uh, examples that I found really interesting. Um, the first one is AI, uh, essentially it's a model that is able to detect and um, evaluate and assess the the quality of an image in, in a way. So the, the idea with this is that as a sonographer, let's say a paramedic um, who isn't as experienced um, is looking through their um, the patient with ultrasound, the the computer can actually 
in a way guide them and detect, hey, this is the view you want, right? So it's essentially assessing the the quality of the image, um, and it can uh, eventually the idea is to have it guide um, less experienced uh, or less proficient users to find adequate images for um, assessment. Uh, this next one is uh, this is a study that I, th I think is really cool. It's doing two things. It's refining the image and it's increasing the resolution. Um, so as, as we move down uh, the, the, the rows here, you can move down and across, you can see that the images get sharper um, and they're just, um, they're removing some artifacts and just, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, increasing the resolution artificially with um, intelligence. Um, and that same study also removes, um, they called speckle, uh, speckles, I guess. Um, but it's essentially just denoising it, so making the image more clear. Um, so again, more things that uh, models are, are learning to do and can be applied and make the 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 usage of ultrasound um, for less experienced users a lot easier. Um, that's kind of the goal. And finally, this is three D imaging. I think this is really cool. I had one. I had an image also of like a three D image of a heart, like a full scan, but it was too small and it wouldn't. Yeah, you know, wouldn't you know show up very well, but you know it's mainly used nowadays to like analyze the you know a fetus. Um, but there are other applications for it. I think number E, a lot of uh, yeah example E at the bottom. That one is like a vessel, um, so you can analyze even inside um, vessels and that sort of thing. So it's really cool um, and awesome potential in terms of how um, AI can can help. So what's the outlook? Um, so ultrasound, obviously there are a lot of hurdles that we need to, um, go over, um, I guess. And even though there are a lot of these, these, um, challenges to ultrasound, we have made so many advancements that, um, we're getting very, very close to, um, being able to use this, you know, consistently and make it more of a mainstream thing. Um, some of these studies that I cited actually used, um, you know, the devices like the butterfly. Um, and they're, you know, 10 years ago, that was, you know, that was just a pipe dream, right? Um, but nowadays, battery life has increased. Obviously, we can transmit information a lot better. Um, and AI will be assisting. Um, so there's a lot to look forward to. Um, and I personally hope that they start including this because I think that as, um, as we, can we can incorporate this, we can provide faster and more adequate care for uh, for our patients, uh, even before they get to the hospital. So thank you.